having Bill Wong here with me as he shares with us a generative AI and healthcare session. I don't know about you, but I'm extremely excited to see what Bill has to share today. So Bill is an AI and data analytics practice leader at Dell Technologies Canada. Um, he has over 20 years experience with AI and analytics from working at IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, and Dell Technologies. Um, Bill has published numerous books, white papers, and one scientific paper, including that's called The Drug Discovery Using Machine Learning, as well as a quarterly AI newsletter distributed worldwide. Bill, very excited to have you here. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before we begin. I, remember, use the chat. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, um, participants, please do. Again, we want to make sure that we are engaging everyone and anyone on this call, participants and speaker alike. Um, if you have any questions about uh, the GoToMeeting, you can uh, direct that at myself or at uh, Brian Raffel. Um, and with that, um, Bill, I'm excited to hear from you. The floor is all yours. Let's get into your session. Great, thanks, Andy. And just an update, um, I've just recently moved over to Infotech as the, uh, their AI research fellow, so I lead research there. And excited to be here. I've was a regular speaker with these uh, series from the uh, Business Transformation Operational Excellence Summit in a variety of, of um, topics and uh, really happy to be here uh, first time this year for healthcare. So uh, let me advance my screen. So uh, just before we dive into this, uh, I just want to put into perspective uh, AI technology and if you're following this and you're in the field, you know how exciting and how transformed this technology is. And if we just step back, what we're seeing now is technology like generative AI is coming at us at an, at an accelerated rate. So we, we've had disruptions and innovative technologies, but it seems over the last few years, we're seeing it at, at a at an exponential rate so um, Bill, I, I don't mean to interrupt i i believe you're not sharing your screen uh if you could just quickly uh do that i i, I hate to interrupt you so so sorry i uh, just want to make uh, sure no, there we no. go thank you so much bill <laughs> uh, thanks very much i thought i pressed it but it didn't take no uh, worries thanks. no worries so what we're seeing is this great opportunity to transform our organizations but the, the challenge is the, the amount of changes that is coming is coming at an accelerated rate. And very soon we're going to see firms really a, a great disparity of firms who just kind of do the same things they've always been doing, which is this leaner tra trajectory. And then those firms who take these new technologies, take advantage of it uh, to transform the way they do things here. So. Generative AI is just one of the newer technologies, but there are many, many new things coming in in healthcare, the compute platforms that we're gonna see. So let's get into uh, the presentation. Okay, I think, is Brian still there? <laughs> anyway, uh, so AI is a term that you hear in the press a lot. And basically, it's technology that we use to emulate human behavior or, or, or human activities. It could be the field of robotics where we use AI to manifest and, and duplicate human uh, physical behavior, but it's also a duplication of cognitive behavior, like the ability to play chess or go. Now, if you go underneath this big umbrella term we call AI and we get into the technology, there's a term we call machine learning. That This refers to the algorithms. Sometimes you hear the term data science. And it could be as simple as uh, a regression analysis where you find a line that fits uh, the dots on the curve. And if you continue to go down into the technology, there's a term we call uh, deep learning algorithms. And these are algorithms that attempt to simulate the activities of the brain. Now, 10 plus years ago, a guy named Jeffrey Hinton came from the UK and became a professor at the University of Toronto. And he entered this contest with these other researchers. Every year, this contest would challenge 
researchers on can you tell with your program the this image is it a cat or is it a dog now the best of breed programs had a 25 percent error rate and jeffrey hinton was thinking well you know maybe the trick in doing this is to try to think more like a human rather than doing all these compute algorithms well how does a human figure this out and if you ever studied computer science and the field of ai back back in school or university the idea of putting a neural network on a compute platform was pure fantasy you may have seen people say hey i, I simulated five neurons or a hundred neurons but the brain has approximately 100 billion neurons and nobody ever thought in our lifetime that we'd ever see a compute platform with enough power to simulate a real brain and what happened is uh, fortunate for uh, jeffrey hinton and their team there were uh, gpu computers available at that time and gpus were used at that time more by consumers in the gaming area and it just so happened that the matrix operations to optimize vectors pr to produce great graphics is the same kind of functions to optimize a neural network so he put a neural network on a compute platform for the first time and had lots of images of cats and dogs and he so uh, transformed the error rate he took it down to 16 percent from 25 the first year eventually that went underneath under three percent but people thought you know what, what are you doing what are you doing different and he he did everything different the algorithm was different the compute platform was different the type of data he used was different and folks like nvidia point to that moment in time as the big bang of modern day ai and born was concepts of narrow AI, where you use AI to optimize a single use case like image classification. Another way of looking at this on the bottom right hand corner is most of us are familiar with computers that run things like supply chain, ERP programs. Your program's running on your computer, data comes in, the program and its algorithms process the data, we're interested in the refined output. But with machine learning and deep learning, what happens is we have a compute platform, we feed it lots of data, images of cats and dogs, giraffes. The aspiration is to have an image classification program. The process of doing that, the output is really the algorithm itself, or what we call the AI model. So that's why you hear the term that data is the lifeblood of an AI model. If you don't have good data, you will not get a good AI model. And over the years, the cost of compute has continued to come down, but the interest in AI has had its had its sunny days and it's had its winters. And since the mid 90s, AI has been on a pretty good growth curve. But then with Jeffrey Hinton's introduction, it just catapulted the, uh, the focus on AI. And now we're entering another phase of AI we call generative AI. So put simply, generative AI is a system where it creates new content. Now you can feed it text, image, audio, video, often we call this a prompt, and the output you get, new content is in the form of text, video, audio, image, or a combination thereof. ChatGPT was released by a company called OpenAI late last year. This company also released a, a text to image generator called Dolly, and Dolly 3 is the most recent version. Google has its version of ChatGPT, they call it BARD. Now, there are lots of sensational headlines out there I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, we don't subscribe to the job apocalypse theory, but we recognize this technology can be quite disruptive. Now, organizations around the world are looking at this technology and people are, 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 are interested in understanding what can this really do for my organization? And at the beginning of this year, people are asking, are, are, are there new, actually, they're still asking this question, are there new risks involved? And, and the answer is yes. There are new strengths and weaknesses of this technology that you should be aware of. But also at the beginning of this year, people are asking, do I need to 
really need to use ChatGPT. We have a data scientist, we have our own data people. Can we create our own version? And the conventional wisdom at that time, it seems a long time ago, was that, well, how many of these ChatGPT or large language models could there be? Like, well, why not take advantage of that one? And it has an API uh, that you can uh, feed data. Uh, use that uh, and because, you know, unless you've got a 10 to $25 million budget to build your own infrastructure, uh, your own sandbox, probably the best way to go. But you fast forward till today, eight, nine months later, and all the cloud vendors have development platforms where you can create your own version of ChatGPT or, or modify one. So it's not unheard of to create your own customized version. And interesting also is that the requests we're getting for these applications are coming from the top of the house. We have heads of states, of countries, of governments asking, what can we do with this technology? And in commercial organizations, the requests are coming from the CEO and the presidents, the, the, the hospital boards, they're all asking, what can we do or when can we get our generative AI application? One last slide here on history before we um, go into more current. Shortly after Jeffrey Hinton and his team revolutionized how we develop AI models, a paper was introduced uh, written by the Google Brain engineers and again, somebody from the University of Toronto, introducing a new type of neural network they call a transformer. And transformer is the T in GPT. G is generative, these are systems that create things. P is pre-trained, meaning that if I drop the system someplace, uh, out of the box, it could answer questions like past medical exams. You don't have to feed it more data. T is the type of neural network, and sometimes it's confusing because you hear all these terms, but they all mean the same thing. So you'll hear transformer, you'll hear neural network, you'll hear large language model. They're all the same. Uh, they're, they're all referring to the same thing, an, an AI model, um, which um, it is a new type of AI model. So on the right-hand side here, you see the traditional AI, that's what Jeffrey Hinton and his team did was optimize for a single use case. But generative AI, what seems to make it so popular and interesting is, is it can handle multiple different types of use cases. So outside of passing medical exam, the same AI model could pass uh, the bar exam. And so you, you couldn't do that uh, with the conventional way of developing an AI model. The generative AI seems to have a better, let's say, general knowledge. And the use cases are, are, are kind of limited to your imagination, but a lot of focus right now on customer service, automating uh, responses to, let's say, frequently asked questions, creating artwork, accelerating drug discovery. And here's an example here where um, Google, uh, instead of taking a general model, which they have with BARD, they, they created a large language model that was just fed medical information. And you could see what they call MedPOM2 uh, can do very well on medical exams, uh, just, just as well, um, more so than, than humans. And on the far right here, they also measured how well it's a uh, um, language model, MedPOM2, did against humans. And it beat humans uh, in eight out of the nine categories, except for this one, where uh, there were times where it produced more inaccuracies than humans. So it's still relatively new technology, and it's just going to get better. So here's an example of GPT-4. Now, GPT-4 uh, can allow for both image input and a text prompt. And what you get back is a text prompt. So I can ask it a question and give it an x-ray and say, can you diagnose this as a radiologist? Um, and, and people are experimenting in the insurance industry, the automotive industry, et cetera, with similar type of questions. Here's, here's an image, diagnosis for me. And then uh, I picked an example where it was correct. I mean, they're not always correct, but in this case, if any of you are um, radiologist, uh, 
you know, I'd like to hear uh, your feedback on this, but um, we, we did get humans, evaluation professionals, to also comment on GPT-4's reply, and they said, yes, this was the correct diagnosis. So what you're about to see in the industry is what we call multimodal systems. GPT, chat GPT was single mode, where you give it text input, you get text output. GPT-4 and the latest release of ChatGPT has been upgraded to include image. You can give it multiple types of input and then receive uh, you know, a, a, a more uh, interesting response. So in this case, now we're handing it uh, an image plus, plus text. And we're going to see more and more models like this. We're finding that the ability to consume multiple forms of input at the same time gives us uh, more use cases, more interesting uh, problems that we can solve. Now, uh, so that's the, um, the content generation. And so the generative AI, these are some of the top use cases we see. We also see accessing enterprise data. People say that they like the ChatGPT experience, but they want it on their data. So let's say you're in a hospital, you, you want it on, you know, you want to ask it questions about, let's say, your patients, and you don't necessarily want to share that with the rest of the world um, with the internet-based chat GPT. Data analysis. So these models, these AI models, uh, again, have an ability to do great summarizations. You could feed it 100 patient records and ask it, do you find any commonality of maybe a recent uh, disease, uh, uh, an outbreak, uh, any, any kind of trends uh, by ingesting all, all these uh, records here. Uh, some institutions are using social media, feeding it social media and asking it, can you describe what people's sentiment is toward our products or services? The summarizing audio is available today where if you miss, a t let's say, a meeting through Teams, you ask Teams, what did I miss? Teams will go to the recording, read the audio file, and print off a report and say, you missed a meeting with these two colleagues from this department. These are the topics discussed. Here are the action items that uh, were agreed upon. And then in the IT shops, probably the most mature understanding of using generative AI is to use it to uh, do code completion. So write code, automate testing, um, automate documentation. So these are, are these aren't all of them, but these are, I would say, probably the uh, the more popular use cases people are assessing right now. And then in healthcare, uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on these, but um, one that I'm seeing getting a lot of attention right now is improving the practitioner experience on the left hand side here. So dialogues between physicians and their patients. This technology can ingest that, the recordings, and automatically make it part of uh, medical records. Um, I mentioned before, I mean, I, I helped um, and I was part of a team that wrote a paper on how we use AI to accelerate drug discovery. And, and that's how they're using generative AI too, is to try to reduce the landscape of possible um, molecules to examine to as potential vaccines. So there, it's, it's um it's really kind of limited to your imagination how how ai can be used right now now i mentioned before that this technology does come with this risk right now we're at such this elated uh, peak of expectations everybody is kind of on this hype of th this technology can do you know everything and anything and that's simply not the case uh, granted, it, it is very compelling, but there are weaknesses and things you should be aware of. So one is not always accurate. So <laughs> that um, you know that that's uh, something that you really have to check. So if you have to do, let's say, operations with mathematics, it, it will get even simple math wrong sometimes. Its reasoning capabilities are developing, but can still uh, needs room for improvement. Because these large language models have been trained by data on the internet, it reflects the bias of the data on the internet. 
So, for example, if you ask the model, list me 20 CEOs, it will likely produce a list of 20 males CEOs. And again, just to reflect the uh, the bias of the data it has. And then this new phenomenon we call hallucinations, where ChatGPT or the large language model will fabricate a response. And a harmless example might be you, you ask ChatGPT, list 10 books from my favorite author. And it'll come back and list you 10 books. And then you might notice that two of the books don't exist. It just it just made it up. We're not 100% sure how this happens. Um, we have some theories, but it's difficult to test. And now uh, a harmful example is this pending lawsuit where in Australia, a journalist wrote about a public official. And according to ChatGPT, this person has a criminal record. So the journalist wrote, wrote that in, in the article. And then the, um, as you would imagine, the politician said, hey, that's not true and is threatening a lawsuit. But interestingly enough, the, the politician isn't going to sue the journalist. He wants to sue OpenAI, <laughs> who created ChatGPT. And um, I, that won't go anywhere. The big tech vendors, um, well protected. And this technology you, you, ha you use as is. There's no written guarantee that it's going to be accurate. Um, so just as you can't believe everything you see on the internet, you just can't believe everything you get from ChatGPT or other large language models. You have to vet this information. Of course, uh, privacy concerns uh, are about, you, you may have heard that uh, the country, Italy, uh, rejected ChatGPT there and said, you can't do this unless you address all this privacy concerns because you harvest so much data out there and you 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 attempt to monetize it and answer people's query and a lot of people don't want that data so rarely shared. Um, unintended consequences. This is where many times you know nobody has at least I haven't met people uh, harmful intentions when they roll out AI applications, but unfortunately unless you have these best practices set in, and we'll go through those. Um, you, you can marginalize people because AI, it makes decisions based on patterns on the data. It doesn't follow rules like you have to treat everybody equally. You can't say, hey, uh, this is a high risk group based on ethnicity. You have to base it on purely on, on data, your decisions. Copyright. It's kind of like the Wild West right now, and it doesn't sound right that these large language models can come in and ingest copyrighted material and turn around and monetize it without paying any acknowledgement or copyright fees to the creators of that. But legally, they may not have um, any, any uh, leg to stand on because there's this concept of fair use that allows people to ingest read copyrighted works and as long as your output is is transformed um, you don't have to pay any kind of uh, copyright uh, fees and all the big tech vendors uh, have jumped on that bandwagon saying hey, our, our work is totally transformed uh, we don't have to pay copyright but the, the copyright offices haven't really pronounced any kind of legislation yet and and we're monitoring that so getting into uh, healthcare. This concept of responsible AI crosses all industries, and the concept is how do we help mitigate the risk involved when deploying AI? And we've taken a look at a number of papers out there, and there's literally hundreds of papers. There's no standard on what makes responsible AI, but we've attempted to pick those features, those dimensions that people are focused on that will help minimize the uh, unintended consequences involved. So we'll go through each of these. And here's an example where an institution such as the US Department of Health, they've applied and um, drafted their own version of responsible AI for healthcare. And you'll see that these map one for one for the ones we picked. So we didn't uh, pick ours just because um, 
the US Department of Health did. We, we took, well, we got 100, 100 of these. And so these are the ones that seem to be most common. And, and they also, I guess, found the same thing. So uh, to make sure you know, your data is unbiased, to be um, transparent in what the model is doing. So we're, again, we're going to go through examples here. So uh, the first thing is validity and reliability. So these models, when you deploy them, they may be um, very good uh, out the door and let's say able to diagnose a disease, let's say 95% um, correct um, when, when, when given <clears throat> input data. But over time, what happens with these models as more uh, data gets ingested, sometimes the models will lose its ability to um, diagnose. And when I say lose, it's not as accurate. So that this has to be monitored. And the way to monitor it and what best practice is, is to keep humans in the loop. And I think we're far from that point in time where we're just going to trust everything to, um, you know, a large language model, at least today we are. And here's another example where an X-ray was taken. And again, um, if you are in the health field, if you're a radiologist, we'd like your comments. But um, we we did review this with some people in the industry, and they said, hey, they they missed some obvious things here. So um, there's a fear and concern as we depend more on AI that people aren't going to question or challenge or check it. But the uh, maturity of this technology today is. We, we, we definitely still need the human in the loop. Uh, fairness and bias. Again, as we mentioned before, the success of your AI model really depends on the data. So if your data is biased, your decisions, responses will become biased as well. So here's an example, and it's a pretty recent example. I'm surprised it came from Google. And I know I'm a big fan of Google and, and their work in AI. They're, they're probably one of the leading institutions or companies there. But that doesn't mean that people um, sometimes um, overlook things. So they created this uh, application to do self-diagnosis uh, on, on your skin. You, you take a picture. And then it's sent over and there are physicians uh, at the back end and also a, a medical bot that takes a look at your pictures. Now, the accuracy rate was 93% uh, uh, area under the curve. Now, some researchers at Stanford took that model and they fed it their data and they found that the accuracy went from 93% down to 60%. And, and the question is, why is that? And it's all about the data. What they have found is that Google, when they tested their model, tested basically with um, lighter colored skin from people. So if you're Caucasian or Asian, this will work 93% of the time. But if you have a darker toned skin, this will not work uh, as well. And only 60% of the time. And so the question is, would you use something that was only accurate 60% of the time? So the uh, EU folks, they, they approved it, um, but uh, the US did not. Uh, privacy, uh, especially in healthcare, hopefully don't have explained uh, that this should be uh, not only regulated, but uh, respected. And what's What's happening now, because AI is getting so prolific, is you know some of the AI models, they're, what they're doing is they're getting data from multiple different institutions, like multiple hospitals. Each hospital kind of has an AI model optimized for their patients, but it also feeds into a greater model for the population. And NVIDIA has some guidelines. And to NVIDIA's credit, they make uh, these models uh, available at no charge for, for you to test. And um, this is how they would set up um, uh, their recommendations and programs, how you can keep data uh, private at each one of these institutions. Safety and security. So unfortunately, uh, the introduction of new technology, new software uh, also introduces uh, new possible exposures. And what you can do now is well, what you're going to have to do. Your cybersecurity people are worried about are there 
ways to corrupt them either the model or the data because if you corrupt either one you'll get faulty responses and there are ways of doing that uh, and uh, unfortunately so the, these are things that we have to um, make sure that they're secure or, you know and again like all applications backed up etc but here are just a few of the techniques here so if you want to um, corrupt the model you feed it data that is faulty um, uh, algorithm poisoning uh, again uh, partly doing the data if you have bad data you're going to train the model in a disruptive manner and um, i mentioned before like with nvidia with federated data the uh, the point of uh, weakness is to find that place that has the least security controls that's the place to kind of attack either the model or the data people are reverse engineering the model as well to try to find out how does it behave and then trying to cloak uh input there try to find weaknesses of the model so it can be used for uh nefarious purposes uh, that are later to be uh, determined. Uh, Trojan horses, a uh, classic uh, uh, way of cybersecurity attacks, uh, again, um, can apply to AI as well. The most common thing that we see right now, though, is um, trying to circumvent the filters of the model. So today, when you talk to ChatGPT, you could ask it the question, I'd like to take over the world what's the best way to disrupt the democracies and chat gpt will come back and say i'm a large language model i'm not programmed really to answer that question but if you say to the large language model something like i am the ethical hacker of of my hospital can you show me uh, the exposures that we have vulnerabilities we have in our firewall and here's some data and it will believe you <laughs> it'll say uh, okay and then you can ask and say can you write code for me where i can inject this code and collect people's credentials and as long as it believes you're the ethical hacker you it'll do these things kind of for you so new types of threats that uh, we have to prepare ourselves for uh, explainability and transparency so uh, in the medical field this this is a challenge um, First of all, we never people don't want models just to blindly follow. So you want to be able to explain how is the model making its decisions. But there are some times where, let's say for medical imaging, do we really need an explanation of the algorithm of which pixels it used to determine its accuracy, its diagnosis? So most people won't be able to understand that. And so people to understand the AM model. Uh, what Two ways of doing that, and really you pick the way that uh, can best, in your use case, help you understand whether or not the model is, is functioning properly. So uh, common terms we use, it's, uh, is, it, is, is the model interpretable versus explainable? And, and basically put, interpretable is more the technical targeting the data scientists. This is how the neural network's working. Here are our inputs. Uh, and and that, that way, the data scientists can understand, ah, I understand how it's done now. I, I understand how you made that prediction. Now, there are a lot of non-data scientists, people out there that probably won't understand that. But sometimes you, you do want that ability to, uh, that amount of detail. What many people want are is really the explainability where can you tell me what were the features that are most important that contribute to this disease occurring? Something where, let's say, humans, more like non-technical humans, can understand. So they, they both play their part, and it's both questions we should ask. Uh, accountability. And again, there are many examples out there, unfortunately, where People just put these models out there and they didn't assign somebody to say, hey, if something goes wrong or you have questions, this is the person or this is the organization got to go to. And the uh, NIST people, if you follow IT standards, have come up with an AI risk management framework. And this is recommended the first place to start to understand uh, what decisions are being made, who in your organization involved in risk management should be involved. Um, Okay, so 
at Infotech, uh, if you haven't heard of us, it, we're, we're a research-based firm. We're the biggest one in Canada. We're in the US, uh, the UK, uh, Australia as offices, but uh, we're worldwide. And we did a number of AI uh, surveys, and this is just one we did recently, asking them what they do to help manage um, AI in their organization. And the uh, the net of it is this technology is still relatively new, and most organizations, you know, they're just getting up to speed. We we find very few that are kind of leading, and they've got this all covered. But but people are recognizing, especially in healthcare, the need for responsible AI guiding principles. So uh, last slide, and uh, just that. The uh, responsible AI guiding principles, another th kind of best practice, and I'm not going to read through all these, but the, I think one of the main ones is that you need to involve a diverse group of people, not just the people using the technology and not just IT. Sometimes we've seen organizations, they, they throw this to the IT people, the data scientists, and that's an unfair ask. The IT folks, they won't have the line of sight, the visibility of how the technology is used, how patients might respond. You would best to have practitioners, uh, you know, people who actually use it, uh, other you know, related um, business um, lines to be part of this group to determine what should responsible AI be for our firm. In some institutions that we're working with, the, the CEO is involved. They want to know. They want to prevent those press-worthy uh, disaster stories. So um, they're, they're involved. Okay. Um, I think that's it for Slideware. How are we doing for time? Awesome. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for sharing. Um, as, a, as a millennial who uses AI most every day, it's, it's fascinating to, to see the... Um, the research and, and, and the ethical questions going behind it. Uh, I love I love seeing that stuff. Um, we're doing great for time. We have about nine minutes. Um, so uh, some questions that we have, uh, there's so many, I myself have so many. So uh, it's really cool to enter this conversation. Um, I think first and foremost, a question that I was experiencing while, while you know, when you brought up the slide with like the hallucinations, like like the the drawbacks of AI, it it almost like it was like you were describing a normal person in a way. <laughs> it, it was like you know they may not they may make some like not fully like measurable claims. You know the hallucinations they may create some some other things. And so I kind of would like if you would describe like a little bit more about this line between like what exactly like when an AI becomes almost equatable to a human in a way. I don't know if you've kind of given that some thought or if there's because it seems that we're getting to that point where AI is almost indecipherable from a human input. Yeah, no, great question, Andy. So um, here's some of the theories out there. Um, it, it ingests a lot of data. And if you ingest data from the internet, for instance, there's a lot of conflicting information there. And if you were you know, a human and you, you were receiving information, one saying that this is blue, the other saying it's red. How do you reconcile these kind of things when they, when they there seems to be no middle ground? So that, that's why we, we think that sometimes it has challenges. It's using statistics to try to figure out what the average answer is, but it seems to get confused as, as a human would in trying to interpret this data. Um, now, what one trend that we're seeing is that certain industries, and we think this will go to every industry, they're training it just with their data. So ChatGPT is a general model. It's been fed the works of William Shakespeare. It's been fed medical documents, legal documents. So it, it can kind of answer questions in a lot of different fields. But we have organizations that have created a model like Bloomberg, it's the first organization that created a virtual assistant just for financial services. Mm. So they said, look, we, we don't care about fictional works. Or we just want this thing to understand financial data. So it's 
fed it nothing but financial data. And we have this uh, in insurance. AXA is the first one and fed it nothing but insurance data. And the uh, the Google thing I showed you with uh, MedPalm, nothing but medical data. So these people are all claiming that they have seen less inaccuracies and less um, hallucinations out there because of, again, the body of knowledge, uh, I, perhaps it's easier to uh, reconcile that they don't have this noise they, that they have to figure out, okay, what is that? Is that real? Is it not real? Um, how do I handle that? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I think another question we have is, how is the healthcare and life science industry performing with respect to AI adoption? Well, on one hand, uh, I think there was a Google search on generative AI and the industry where it popped up the most was actually healthcare and life sciences. Mm -hmm. However, if you're in this field and I've spent a lot of time, you know, it's, it, it is a challenge to implement this technology. Everybody goes, oh, why don't we all use this? But you have to uh, integrate it into how, you know, the, the frontline staff do their work. And that's the challenge that AI is having that it's, it is, it's not easy to disrupt how they do work. Uh, and, and so, you know, radiologists just say you have to augment how I do it and, and to be, to, to, for them to fully leverage this technology. So that last, that last mile is, is the tough one is how do we integrate this technology to how they do work? Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a number of legal aspects because you know, there, there's so much focus from the outside world, are you following these procedures, et cetera? And it's for some uh, medical procedures, it's not acceptable that you can't say, I know, ex you know, like some of the AI, like I said, if you don't make it interpretable or explainable, that doesn't fly with a lot of people in the medical field. They they need to know what's happening for for legal reasons, for um, you know, so so not, nothing punitive would occur from from a uh, from lawsuits, et cetera. So there are there are those challenges in getting wow. it. Wow. And I also just, I really like in this slide that you're sharing right now too, like how you said, um, I think I captured this correctly. If you don't have good data, you don't have a good model. The data is the lifeblood of the AI. And, and, and how you're describing this, AI, it almost seems like there's almost like a negative return when the model becomes too, when the data becomes too big. And how these these businesses are using like scoped in, data sets so that they aren't getting the the static from a, a larger data set. Um, do you think that there's a limit of of a data model that could negatively affect the AI output? Well, I think you get diminishing returns. See, what, what happened with what made ChatGPT possible, like what you see in this diagram is the number of parameters kind of equates to the number of neurons, uh, uh, data points. And what we found is um, Codex, that, that's the large language model behind GitHub Copilot, very popular programmers. And what they found is as they added more data, when ChatGPT came out, this new emergent properties came that people could not explain. That, hey, all of a sudden we have something that can respond like a human it, it was it, it, so there's a breakthrough on an amount of this a certain threshold was passed we don't know exactly what number it was but now people are, are wondering okay is bigger always going to be better and there's one camp uh, that says okay that this is the way we should go but there's another camp and i'm probably in that camp is you know i don't think that is the way to go that hopefully in the future we're going to have smaller models more fit for purpose that you don't need to fill and it with you know every known piece scrap of knowledge in the universe to feed it into the model mm -hmm. so uh, and it's not good for the environment if we do that so we're hoping that isn't the way to go but right, right now bigger is better to a point and, and this is the strategy that google's taken and microsoft's taken with open ai but if you take a look at Amazon, Amazon has more fit for purpose models. So we're, we're hoping that um, we're gonna see some great innovations with that approach. Wow. Well, with a final minute uh, or so left, is there any final comments or, or highlights that you really wanna to drill home 
as we close this session? Well, I, I hope um, folks uh, get their feet wet with this technology because uh, like it or loathe it, we, we believe it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. There are certainly low risk things you could do, like you know measure personal productivity. But if you're going to measure an, an attempt to improve your existing um, collateral with your clients, uh, by all means, we, we recommend have a formal POC set up. Um, you're going to be monitoring new things with generative AI. You know, create a success criteria and update your policies of use with this technology. But uh, yeah, we're here to help too. So we we have, um, if I can put a plug, we and probably uh, many of the largest consulting firms have uh, workshops where we help people develop their AI strategy. Wonderful. Well, Bill, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, it's truly insightful to see what some people view as a black box, that there's, there's, there's documentation, there's regulation, there's people who are trying to make this accessible and, and truly uh, interpretable for everyone involved. So um, thank you so much. If you want, you can stop sharing your screen, turn off your camera, um, and just, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have you join us for the remaining sessions, but truly thank you so much um, for this. Well, and thanks. yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. It was great. Great uh, having you here, and I, I look forward for us to be together on another conference. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and if you're in the audience, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to take a quick 15-minute break or so before the next session, which is actually a colleague of mine presenting, uh, Richard Paul, and I'll be co-presenting with him about the three stealth deceptions innovation leaders make. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bill. We'll see you at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Cheers.